and welcome to another episode of Experts Speak. Today, I have the distinct privilege and honor of speaking with Danielle Hennes. Daniel, thank you for being my guest today. No, thank you, Michael. I'm very excited to be here. Well, it's going to be a fun, fun conversation because Danielle is going to help us learn how to make our presentations memorable. And I know I've I've done a lot of presentations, Danielle, in my life that I walk, you know, walk away from the going, I'm confused. I bet they are too. And I, I think a lot of people struggle with it of how to make them not necessarily pretty, but memorable. So we want to talk about all kinds of things around presentations. And, and that presentation is whether it's a, a PowerPoint, a webinar, an in-person speaking. I mean, it's the whole gamut. So let's talk about that. And let me ask you, first of all, how in the world did you get doing things like you're doing? Yeah, it's a great question. So in a previous life, I was only a graphic designer and I worked for a research company and I would get these presentation decks sent to me about a day or so before a conference from researchers or scientists that were going to go present at a conference and they'd be like, can you make this look pretty? And yes, but that's not really the point of design, right? Like, why are we right. communicating a message? And it should yeah. be ideally, if you're communicating your research, that you've done something really impressive and that should be right. the focus, right? <laughs> and so after enough of these, I went to my supervisor at the time and I was like, you know, we're getting a lot of these presentations super last minute. We can't really do much with them because there's like 20,000 bullets on every single slide. <laughs> so can we create some type of, I don't know, handout or workshop or something to talk to the researchers ahead of time? And she was like, yeah, sure, go for it. So I spent about a year researching peer reviewed articles and digging into books about how people learn and best practices for presentations. And I made my first workshop to give to the researchers to hopefully make my job easier. And then that just kind of morphed and evolved and has led into me having my own business, helping people make better presentations now. And I I love it because I have a background in teaching, I have a background in psychology and graphic design. I've been able to kind of combine all those together to help the presenter cater to their audience, right? And make that yeah. message stick. That's awesome. I love that. You said something that I wanna, I wanna unpack just a, a tad and, and we might just go here. Hel helping, uh, you, 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 you researched how people learn Yep. Versus what I want to say. Yes. Yep. Vastly different. So let's talk about that and the importance of understanding your audience and how do people learn in, in all of that as it relates to making presentations memorable? What'd you learn? Yeah. And I think that's oftentimes the biggest problem with presentations is that we're focused on what I as the presenter need to say and what I want to remember not to forget and what I am needing to have for my own comfort. And that's why we have 8,000 bullets on a single slide because we want to remember our own speaking notes, right? We want to remember what we want to say. We want to focus on what we need, but the audience doesn't care about any of that, right? The audience right. doesn't, if you forget something, the audience doesn't know one way or the other. Yeah. So it's more about what does the audience need to be able to process the information that you're saying. And most presentations don't take into account what the audience already knows and what they need to know in order to do whatever it is that you're telling them, right? So whether mm. that's you're selling them something, you're giving them information, you're uh, teaching them something, any of those things aren't going to work unless you've thought about your audience and what they mm. know and what they need to know. Yeah, yeah, that's really good. I've seen some presentations around, uh, well, in lots of areas, and, and, and I love your feedback on this, is taking a construct that's already in the mind of your audience and being able to relate that to whatever you're getting ready to communicate so it's not new is that good yeah no that's perfect so those are actually called schemas or schemata so okay. in psychology we have these the way that we organize information in our brain is very much aligned with our family how we learned a language our culture and all of that but in general there tends to be similarities across schemas right so i use the example of movies or books or whatever you want to do so let's say books right so books have books in general is a schema and mm -hmm. then within books if you're like a really big reader you might separate out into the author or you might separate out into genre depending on okay. how you do it sure so there might be some differences well let's just use genre for the purposes of this so you might have romance history nonfiction, fiction sci-fi fantasy whatever else and within those you'd have subcategories of that right. right so within nonfiction, you would have 
history, you'd have self help or improvement, yeah. you'd have, you know, so on and so forth. And you could keep going down to have this whole like organizational structure of all these schemas. And the idea is that if I'm using that as an example of something else that has that same organizational structure of how, you know, we have these categories of something, which is oftentimes most businesses or yeah. the way products work or anything else that you've learned, right? So let's say I'm talking, I'm relating it to like an organization. I'm saying, well, our department is very similar to the improvement area of right. nonfiction books, right? And I'm relating it because of what we talk about and what we do and all of that. And I'm using that as a schema, then that's going to stick more with your audience than right. me just wanna... explaining the organization, right? Yeah. It helps us get our get our, our, our hands around it, our head around. Okay. What are you talking about? Oh, that's what you're talking about. Okay. Yeah. And it's, it's, um, yeah, the schema is really important. I like how you, how you use that because I think in a lot of times people, business owners do presentations and they just, well, dare I say they just you know throw up over everybody. Here's what you need to learn about social security or retirement and estate planning. Blah, right? It's like, oh, I, I, and it's all just gobbledygook because yeah. I don't have any schemas. Is another way. Let, let me put it in my language. It's a mm -hmm. it's a hook that I can hang my hat on. Is a yeah. schema, right? And I need a hook for for whatever you're you're doing to go. Okay, I'm in I'm in the ballpark. Now explain to me why I need whatever you're right. Um, yeah. To put it a slightly different way, right? Like, so sure. let's say you're doing, I don't know, insurance. Or sure. something that I know nothing about, right? But I have some vague understanding of taxes or finances yeah. or personal finance. It's kind of like saying, okay, there's this animal in Australia called an echidna. Mm -hmm. And an echidna is sort of like a porcupine or a hedgehog. It's in between those sizes and it rolls up in a ball, kind of like an armadillo. Right. So I've just now used multiple schemas that, you know, a porcupine, a hedgehog, an armadillo versus saying it's an animal. It's about two feet long. No, not two feet yeah. a foot long <laughs> with pointy spikes and can roll up and can like that doesn't it doesn't give you the same amount of information. In right. such a short amount of time. I have to use more words. I have to explain it further and it doesn't stick as well. It's it's more memorable. Absolutely. Let, let's let's talk about the importance of that and, and some of the mistakes that people make when designing a presentation, whether it's a and whether it's an oral, a live oral presentation, like you're at a, a dinner party on stage, TED Talk or whether you're doing a PowerPoint. Let's talk about some of the, the errors that people make and then how can we how can we do it better? Yeah. The biggest mistake I see is you open PowerPoint. So <laughs> with that, I mean, people open PowerPoint and there's a template. There yeah. is a title, there's bullets, maybe there's an image placeholder off the side and you fill it. But really what you should be doing is thinking about what am I going to say? What does the audience know? How can I relate it to what they know and make an outline? So open Word document, take out a sheet of paper, pull out some sticky notes, whatever you need to do. Mm -hmm. And think through the order of organization that makes the most sense. Ideally filling in a story with that so that you can kind of have a flow through throughout the whole presentation. But yeah. if nothing else, thinking about how you organize that. So we never want to have more than four ideas that we're presenting at one time because our working memory can't hold more than four ideas at a time. Mm -hmm. really. And so if you're presenting seven different ideas, the audience is only going to remember three or four of those, and they're going to choose whatever they think is most important. Yeah. And that may not be what you think is the most important. So you need to be selective and be refining your own ideas. In writing, there's an idea called cut your darlings, right? It's the same idea with presentations. Cut the things that you value because the other things are more valuable, and you want to make sure that the audience hears those things. Yes. So I'd say the biggest thing is just don't open PowerPoint until you already know what you're saying and then think through how do you show that as opposed to just putting a title and bullets. You should ideally think through how do I best showcase this message in a slide that is hopefully visual. I can still have text, but that text needs to be the one idea. So one yeah. idea that you're presenting at a time on one PowerPoint slide, not 10, not two. Oh. <laughs> and yeah, yeah. And when you have text, two or three sentences, don't read it to me, right? I mean, it's that whole thing of, yeah, one or two words on a slide. I look at PowerPoint slides and presentations, I, really good ones, remind me a lot of great billboards on the side of a road. Mm -hmm. yeah. Three or four words, maybe a great picture, but it's a, it's a launching pad for me to go, oh, there's my next one. And I should be smart enough in whatever I'm talking about to communicate with you, right? That, I mean, that's how I do things. 
don't know if that's right or not, but it's just how I do it. No, um, that's absolutely right. And once again, you use the schema with the billboard. So, I, <laughs> uh, <laughs> I hadn't thought about that. But yeah, so there's a couple psychology theories. One that I talk about a lot is Richard Mayer. He did this research in terms of how people process information. And mm -hmm. what he found was most effective. He looked at written words and spoken words, uh, just spoken words, just written words, visuals and spoken words. And the visuals and spoken words were the most memorable. Mm -hmm. So if we can align our presentations in that way, it's going to stick with our audience more. Just like a billboard, you're not, you're going to be driving past it and you have a split second to read that billboard. You don't have time to read the whole thing. And right. if they're reading it, they're not paying attention to you because we can't process spoken words and written words at the same time. Right. I'm sure we've all tried to like write an email while you're talking to someone else and you don't, you can't do both things, right? Because you're writing what you're saying or you're saying what you're writing. And that's not going to work for your audience either because they can't multitask in that way because it's using the same system in our brain. It's both yeah. auditory information. Absolutely. Yeah. And it's, and when you have, when you start with the word document, like you said, and you're outlining and you've got a flow and you've got a theme, uh, it's very funny. You know, it's very, funny. I, you know, we help people create books and we start with an outline. It's like, never, never start just writing your book. That's like the stupidest thing you can do. Get an outline first. Do, and that's exactly what you're telling people to do in presentations. Don't open PowerPoint. PowerPoint is like the last thing you do that after that, the outline's done. And, and dare I say, I've actually been at two or three presentations. They never use PowerPoint. They use like a, a Google Doc. And I'm like, that's great because it had the information and, and I was connecting with the person. They had my ear and my attention. And guess what? It was memorable because I, rem I remember it, right? Yeah. Isn't yeah. that what we're trying to get done? Absolutely. And I think sometimes people are scared that they're going to forget what they want to say if they don't have all the text on the slide. I'd say one, the audience is not going to remember what you say if all the text is on the they slide, first off. No. But two, if you practice it, there's ways in which visuals or slides can trigger memory. And so if you yeah. practice it, it works the same way. Like my slides are basically mostly images. There's yes. a few words here or there. There may be some graphs or charts, depending on what I'm talking about. Yeah. But I don't have any notes. I know yeah. exactly what I'm saying for that slide because that slide is a representation of what I want to talk about. And so it triggers that for me. And and what that communicates to my audience, I'm speaking to my audience now, what that communicates is her expertise. It builds credibility because she's not using a crutch to go, okay, this slide is slide 42. This slide says, no, it's like, boom, there it is. Here's what I want to talk to you about. And, and with rapt attention, you have me in the palm of your hand because uh, I see a picture, but I'm like, well, what does that picture mean, right? You're going to explain it because you're the expert. So as you're thinking about presentations, whether it's a sales presentation, whether it's a webinar, whatever it is, you need to be perceived as that expert Yes. because they are looking I, here. Correct me if I'm wrong. This is what I'm convinced of. People are not looking for more information. They can find that on Google. They're looking for a, a an expert, a guide who can take them where they want to go using that information. Is Do you find that? Is that fair? Yeah. And ideally, that's what you should be, right? So you may have talked about like the hero's journey before with your audience, but basically it's every single story that has ever been made into Hollywood. Right. Uh, so it's basically you have this hero, they go on this journey, they have some type of difficulty, there's a mentor that helps them along, and then they go back to the world and they're changed. Think about Star Wars or yeah. Harry Potter or Lord of the Rings or any of those like epic movies, right? And the idea is that when you're presenting, your audience should be the hero, not yeah. you as the presenter. And right. that you as the presenter are the mentor that's helping them guide them along and you're giving them solutions to a problem that they have and that will make them more likely to buy from you because you're then solving a problem for them but you are this when you're the hero it just feels self elitist right. right like you're just you're preaching about yourself as opposed to helping your audience and people are more likely to want your services if they know how they can be helped yeah, I'll I'll never be an Avenger, right? I'm never going to be the hero. But 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 if you if you guide me down the, the way, I could be Luke Skywalker, right? I can go do that because you're right. I'm building. Plus, it builds confidence in me, and I bond more connected with you, so we have a longer relationship. Which is what we're trying to do in business: is connect and communicate, not just throw it all on the wall and see what sticks. And the other aspect of, of re why this is so very important is in business. Um, probably, honestly, less than 3% of the people who are at your workshop, on your webinars, less than 3% are in the market today 
for what you have to sell. They're going to be in the market in the next month, three months, nine months. And if they don't remember what you said, um, they're going somewhere else. But if they remember, they are more likely to come back and go, yeah, I don't remember everything she said, but that one thing, I want to go back and find that and they're back on your website. Is that fair? Yeah, it's pretty amazing. I have people who attended my workshops five years ago and they come and attend a different one that I'm leading somewhere. And they're like, you know, I remember that workshop that you gave five years ago. It had those rabbits that you were talking about. Yeah. That's five years ago. And you can remember a specific aspect of a presentation, mm -hmm. but there's so many presentations I attend where it's like, I don't remember a single thing after 10 minutes after leaving that presentation. And so you want to make sure that you are giving a presentation that the audience is going to remember because yes, ex you're exactly right, Michael, not everyone's going to be buying today. And oftentimes we need multiple touch points before we buy. So yeah. that webinar that they're in, that may not be the part that they, that they're going to be on the hook to buy from. But if you have a call to action and then you follow up with a newsletter and then they see your work down the road because they're following you on social media or whatever it is, and that webinar was memorable and you showed them how to solve a problem, they're much more likely to buy from you at that point. Yeah, absolutely. So let's let's give some tips, pointers or something for people who are giving webinars or so in the next week or two or three, or they're going on a stage and they're scared to death. What are some, some just low-hanging fruit things besides don't open PowerPoint first. So, so make, make your thoughts, but what are some other things people could, could take with them? Yeah. So I would say if you are presenting and you are using, so I'm going to break it into a couple of categories. So if you're okay. using data, I would encourage you to think about your presentation as a marriage proposal. So if I went to you and said, I want to marry you because we can save a bunch of money in taxes and have a better 401k for our retirement you're probably not going to say yes. Yeah. But oftentimes that's what data heavy presentations are like. Mm -hmm. So instead you put yourself in your audience's shoes. What do they want to hear? Well, they want to hear that you're going to, that they're the best person that you're ever going to meet, right? That you are excited to go on this journey with them. That's a marriage proposal that they're going to go with. So thinking about that, how do you take, you can still use that data, but you have to first talk to them in a way that they want to hear. Mm -hmm. So that's for the data people. Uh, for the people who have anxiety, I would say, I've worked with a lot of people who have anxiety and one of the people I worked with, uh, we'll call her Jill. She was like super nervous. She wasn't sleeping. She was throwing up before presentations. The anxiety was bad. Right. And so first off, if your anxiety is that, if that your anxiety is that bad, you should probably find a therapist because there's a yeah. lot of things that can be done. Right. At least find some type of coach that can work with you. But there are certain techniques that can work, whether your anxiety is that bad or whether you just have regular nervousness before a presentation. So the biggest thing that I recommend is squeeze your toes mm -hmm. and release them because you can do that on stage, you can do it on Zoom, and you can do it at whatever point that you're giving the presentation. Just make sure that you squeeze it in a way that you're not going to fall over. Right. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and surprisingly, that releases a lot of the adrenaline. Yeah. If you can, go do something ahead of the presentations, like go for a walk, go do some squats, whatever it is to release that energy that oftentimes will calm down your amygdala enough. Uh, some yeah. people really like music or doing visualization exercises, all those work too. But if there's one thing that you do, I'd say find a way to like squeeze the energy and release it because that's going to make it easier for you to deal with anxiety on the stage. Yeah. And then for everyone else that's just giving a presentation, I would say one idea at a time. So when you come to your presentation, show one thing as you're talking about it. If you're giving a webinar, the more movement you have, the more in tune your audience is going to be. And if you are showing one thing at a time in a presentation, you're going to remember that point based off of that one slide. Mm -hmm. And it's going to be easier for you to remember what you want to talk about. You can always use the notes tab in PowerPoint to put things that you want to talk about there. Mm -hmm. That's something or in Google Slides or Keynote, they all have them. Yeah. And that way you can still remember if it's a presentation that you're like presenting tomorrow and you don't have time. That's still something that you can do. But the more movement that you have in the presentation, not distracting movement, like don't have any animations that like bounce right. in because that's not what people want, right? That's just distracting. But having change of slides, having things that are one idea at a time, people are going to be more likely to follow along with you. And it's going to be something that keeps them engaged. Yeah, that's awesome. That's awesome. Marriage proposal. Yeah, I like that. Um, and squeezing your toes. That's awesome because, uh, yeah, I've heard that from other people. I just forget about that. And then... Um, one idea at a time. That's that's so, so very important. Um, I'm going to add two more things real quick. Don't worry about being perfect. 
I, yeah. I get presentations and I, I unfortunately I still um say like um once in a while um like <laughs> but you know why everybody else does and it makes me human yes and what the other thing that I found is when I have anxiety coming up to a presentation is I practice and I practice and I practice and I practice and I practice until I am just tired of the dumb presentation, but I practice. And what that does is it takes away the anxiety because I know what's coming up in my slides. I know what's going on. I know where I'm going. So now I can connect. So practice, practice. Yeah. And um, and like, and all those filler words, unless they're every other word, right? nobody really cares. If they're, exactly. if they're constant and you're um, like um, talking and um, like I'm having trouble understanding you, that's a different story. In which case, practice helps. The other thing is, is that that probably comes from anxiety. So releasing that adrenaline. And when you practice, I recommend practicing so that you're walking. And then when you get to a point where you would pause naturally, so a comma, a period, a change of idea, whatever, stop talking, turn around, walk the other way and, and talk that way. Oh, that way you're walking and talking and the pause is the turn and the more you practice that way you're practicing yeah. pausing and the more it. you pause the less ums and likes you say yeah oh oh my goodness that's so brilliant what she just re rewind this thing and, and listen to that because what the mental picture the schema that just came to me was um uh, was it ferris bueller's day off right bueller bueller right that guy he was boring and if you don't have a little bit of inflection a little bit of pauses as you're communicating you're going to be boring. Yeah. And that's part of practicing is practicing pauses, practicing yes. transitions, waiting yeah. for it to come out. And it's all part of being professional as you make presentations that are memorable. Uh, Danielle, we could talk for a long, long time because you don't know this about me. My, my son, we did homeschooling and, and we didn't do professional sp or, uh, sports or anything. We did um, competitive speech and debate. Oh, and so I, I was a speech coach for five years and I love all of this around presentation. So we could definitely talk for a long, long time. But instead of us doing that, let us let us give our audience an opportunity to connect with you. So this this is, is really, really important. If you want to. Hit, all right, let me make my pitch as a business owner. If you want to increase your sales without spending more money on advertising, Learn how to present better on stage, in person, closing, all of that. That's presentation. Learn how to do that better. Your, your closing ratio goes up. Your net profit goes higher. And it doesn't cost you a penny. Learn how to do that at Danielle's website. Danielle, where do people go to find out, to connect with you, and to, to learn more about how to make presentations more memorable? Absolutely. Yeah. So I'm on LinkedIn. I post a lot of things there. Danielle Hennis, if you search me, I'll come up. I'll also give you the link that's I post twice a week or so and it's presentation tips uh, my website is make it memorable dot studio so you can find more information there and I'm currently having a five week presentation workshop coming up that's on Eventbrite and listeners to this podcast get $100 off so I'll give you that link as well. Woohoo. Okay. That's great. Make it memorable.studio is where you're going to find her. We're going to have that in the show notes and everything because you need to probably re listen to this whole thing and understand the importance of knowing how people learn before you communicate to them changes everything. And then understanding really how to create your presentation so that they are memorable because that's really what we're after. Danielle can, can help you with that in a, in a variety of ways. So reach out to her. I'm going to have all the links down below in the show notes. So if you're on your phone or walking the dog or doing whatever, check out the show notes, check out Danielle and see how she can help you make your presentations memorable. Danielle, thank you. This has been just invigorating and fun. And I'm glad that you took some time to be my guest today. Yeah. Thank you, Michael. This is a lot of fun. And, you know, I really think, I just want to echo what you said last was, don't be afraid to make a mistake because your audience won't know. So just don't tell them and just keep going. Right? Ah, absolutely. Yeah. They don't know what you do. Yeah. They have no idea. Make yeah. it real. And we all make mistakes. Just make it real. Just go. It's all right. Yeah. Awesome. Absolutely. Thank you. Danielle, thanks so much. Have a great day.